It's not the first time we've been exposed to cultures that are deemed superior to our own. One of the first encounters that the Muslims had of the past was their encounter with Greek philosophy. This occurred within the first 150, 200 years of Islam. For the first time, Muslims got exposed to a theology that was based upon other principles, not based upon the Quran and Sunnah. And Greek mysticism and Greek theology and Greek philosophy was perceived to be, in fact it still is perceived to be, far more superior than religious philosophies. To this day, here in America, 3,000, 4,000, 2,000 years after these philosophers lived, in our undergraduate schools we study their works. We study Plato, Socrates, Aristotle. We study the ancient Greek wisdom and how it was passed to the Romans and so on and so forth. There was no exception back then. In that, when the Muslims came across this mine of information, they were overwhelmed by what they perceived to be a superior culture, a superior thought. And so Muslims of that time reacted in various ways. You had one group amongst them who later became known as the Islamic philosophers, the philosophers of Islam. You had one group amongst them who took these ideas of Greek philosophy and they swallowed them hook, line and sinker completely. All they did was that they changed the words. Aristotle referred to God as the prime mover, the unmoved mover. For Aristotle, God was nothing other than the first cause. That was who he was. Aristotle had no concept of worship, of loving this God, of praying to him, of a God that interacts with us, that feeds us, that nourishes us. No. For Aristotle, the God was the unmoved mover, the prime mover. When these Muslims took Aristotelian philosophy and they transferred it into Arabic, all they did was that instead of saying the prime mover, they said Allah. But the net result was the same. If you were to ask these philosophers to describe this God, this God that they had called Allah, and you look at their works, and they are still around these works. If you were to ask these Muslim philosophers, who is this being that you call Allah? Is He merciful? Is He our creator? Is He the one who provides what we need? Is He the one whom we have to worship? For the philosophers, the Muslim philosophers, the answer to all of these questions would be a resounding no. No. The Muslim philosophers did not believe that Allah created us. They said matter is eternal. God does not create matter. To this day in thermodynamics, modern thermodynamics, there is a maxim, a principle, a theorem. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. Matter cannot be created or destroyed. Rather, it can only transfer from one form to another. And of course, the famous Einstein's equation, E equals mc squared, basically you are correlating matter with energy. Is that matter and energy are correlated. There is a constant amount of energy and matter, and they cannot increase and decrease. For Muslims, no. Matter can and is created and destroyed. Allah creates it, Allah destroys it. Energy is created and destroyed, Allah creates it, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can destroy it. Point being that, for Aristotle, and for the Muslim philosophers influenced by him, God was not the creator. God was not the object of worship, the object of veneration and love, no. He was some philosophical entity whom they had called the prime mover, the unmoved being, the first cause. There was no Jannah and, 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 and Nar. You were to ask the Muslim philosophers, what's going to happen in the afterlife? They would have told you, and these people claim to be Muslims, they would have told you, there is no Akhirah. These are just fables. You're not supposed to accept the Quran literally. Allah will not resurrect the dead. Allah will not have a day of judgment and, and call, call us to account. There is no such thing as a real Jannah and Nar. If you were to ask these Muslim philosophers, is God characterized by any attribute at all? Is He knowledgeable? The Muslim philosophers wrote explicitly in their works that this unmoved mover whom they called Allah does not know, cannot know what man is doing. Allah does not know what we are doing right now according to the Muslim philosophers. Because they took Aristotelian philosophy, Aristotelian logic, Aristotelian cosmology, and they fell into it completely and wholeheartedly. And then they looked at the Quran and Sunnah, well forget the Sunnah, they rejected the Sunnah from outright. They looked at the Quran and they read in 
the works of Plato and Socrates and Aristotle into the Quran. They read in what they wanted to find into the Quran. Instead of approaching the Quran as a source of guidance, they approached it with preconceived notions. God cannot be the creator. So every single verse which said Allah created us, خلق السماوات والأرض, this and that, they said, aha, the unmoved mover, the prime cause. No actual creation. Every verse that challenged their presumptions of Aristotelian logic and philosophy, they reinterpreted so that it conforms with what they thought was superior to the Quran. And in fact, in their writings, they claim that the philosopher occupies a higher rank than the prophets. Because the prophets, they said, and this is literally, I'm quoting from one of their works. The name of this person is very famous, all of you know him. The, philosopher, the, the, the prophets, they said, the prophets are people for the masses. They speak in language for, for the Bedouins and the backward people, telling them of the day of judgment, telling them of this and that. The masses need to hear this to believe it. The philosophers, they speak to the elite. They speak in intelligent language. They speak to those of understanding. And therefore, they speak more truths than the prophets do. The prophets speak in vague, couch terminology for the masses to be better people. But what they're saying is not really true because the prophets, they know, according to the philosophers, that there is no day of judgment. But they want the people to be more pious. So they have this concept in order for the people to be better. The ends justify the means for the philosophers. So this was one group of people, is that they took Aristotelian philosophy, Greek philosophy, and they swallowed it hook, line, and sinker, everything. Another group of people were more moderate. And they looked into Greek philosophy and they picked and chose certain aspects and they rejected others. And so they thought what we'll do is we'll take the best of Greek philosophy and the best of the Quran and we will come forth with a new theology, a new aqidah based on this and that. We'll take the best of this and the best of that and we will form something which is better than what the Muslim philosophers were and better than what the Greek philosophers were. Because we're based upon the Quran and based upon Aristotelian philosophy and logic. And this group primarily is manifested in a group called the Mu'tazila. The Mu'tazila. The Mu'tazila were an extremely heretical group and, and that is why they don't exist anymore. They were so extreme that they died out. Nobody persecuted them. Rather, they were the ones who persecuted uh, the, the Sunni Muslims. If you know this, the incident of Imam Ahmad, for example, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, the Khalifa of the time had become a Mu'tazilite and he had the Imam Ahmad imprisoned because of his theology. Not because of a crime. Not because of something he had done to the state. Nothing. Because Imam Ahmad believed in the Quran and the Sunnah, he was imprisoned tortured, whipped, almost to death, and the Khalifa prohibited her from speaking and talking and having halaqahs and durus. And these were the free thinkers, the Mu'tazilites to this day, uh, they are called the free thinkers of Islam. In reality, they were the most narrow-minded because they did not, could not allow other voices to be heard. And they had to force their opinions upon other people. And they couldn't do it. They couldn't stand against orthodoxy as it was. And so eventually they died out. They don't exist anymore as a viable, uh, real group. And so what they tried to do is they tried to, as we said, combine between Aristotelian philosophy on the one hand and Quranic principles on the other. And of the theology they had was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cannot be characterized by any attribute. He cannot actually be merciful or all hearing or all seeing. Because they said, now this is very deep here, I'm not going to go too deep into it. They said, if we were to affirm another attribute along with Allah, we're actually affirming two beings that have lived eternally. Allah and this attribute of mercy. Therefore, there are two gods and not one. And if we were to affirm three attributes, we're affirming three eternal beings. Therefore, there must be three gods and not one. So according to the Mu'tazilites, it was not allowed to affirm any attribute to God. God had to be attribute-less, no attributes. He was perfect unity. That's what God is. That is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they called him Allah. In reality, this is not the Allah of the Quran, obviously. Okay? Likewise, when it came to issues of qadr, issues of predestination, they flatly denied it. Flatly. They said, Allah does not know what we're going to do. Allah does not control or create qadr. There is no such thing as qadr. And every single verse and every single hadith and there are thousands, not hundreds, thousands of them, which aff affirms Qadr, they flatly denied it or interpreted it. They said it's not possible that 
qadr exists. Even though we as Sunni Muslims believe it is the sixth fundamental of Islam. Our Iman rests upon one of the principles of Iman is Qadr. The Mu'tazila is denied it. And they denied a myriad of other things which we really don't have time to get into. Point is that they thought that by taking the best of both worlds, they'll be able to come out with a unique theology which was better than the two bases that they had come from. The third group of Muslims, the third group of Muslims, the first we said were those who completely took in what the Greek philosophers had to say. The second was those, were those who wanted to merge the two, meld the two, and come out with something they thought was better than the two sources. And the third group of Muslims, now obviously we're being very simplistic because this is not just three distinct groups. You have a spectrum, you have a rainbow. And between the two groups, there are many groups in between as well. Okay, but just to, be simpl uh, to, to simplify the, for the lecture, the third group of Muslims, call them Orthodox or Ahlul Sunnah or whatever you will, they stubbornly refuse to consider Greek philosophy as a source of theology. They said, and this was their thinking, they said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed the Quran and sent the Prophet ﷺ in order for us to be guided to Jannah. And he did not tell us to turn to other sources. He didn't inform us that guidance will be found in anything other than the Quran and Sunnah. Rather, the Quran and Sunnah tells us over and over again that guidance is exclusively within the message of Islam. As Allah says in the Quran, ما فرطنا في الكتاب من شيء We haven't left anything out of the book. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِن تُطِيعُوهُ تَهْتَدُوا Only by following the Prophet ﷺ will you achieve guidance. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, that uh, we have revealed the Quran, لِتُنْذِرَ بِهِ So you can warn with the Quran, only with the Quran. So the Quran is telling us, and the Sunnah is telling us, that the religion of Islam is complete, holistic, full. These Muslim orthodoxy, these Muslim jurists, and these are all the ulama that you've heard of, Imam Shafi'i, Imam Malik, Imam Ahmed, Imam Abu Hanifa, the famous scholars of hadith, the famous ulama of fiqh and tafsir, all of these ulama, we conclude them in this orthodoxy. They reasoned, when you have something which is divine, you don't mix it with something which is man-made. When you have something coming from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which has been preserved, protected in the most eloquent language, there's no need to tinker with it. When something is perfect, the Quran and Sunnah, you don't add or subtract from it. When the Prophet ﷺ has been sent with the entire religion of Islam, with the Sirat al Mustaqim, like he said in one hadith, that I have left you upon the straight path, its night is like its day, no one will deviate from this path except if he wishes destruction for himself. When he has come with this comprehensive, holistic, total religion, why should we give that up? and think that guidance will be found, religious guidance will be found in other places. And so they stubbornly clung to the texts of the Quran and Sunnah. And they refused to be influenced by foreign theologies, foreign ideologies, cultures that were man-made. And they said, we will stick to the divine and leave that which is man-made. They questioned the Mu'tazilites, they questioned the philosophers, and they said, will you give up that which is better for that which is worse? What is the matter with you? How are you judging? History has told us who the winners were in this battle. History has told us. The philosophers lived, wrote, and died. The Mu'tazilites lived, wrote, and died. Orthodoxy lived, wrote, and died. But the beliefs of only one of these three groups is still living. The beliefs and the methodology of only one of these three broad groups is still alive and healthy. The rest of them, they went up and they went down and they were buried. Janazah was prayed over them. Why? Because even the Muslim masses were able to see through the ridiculousness, see through the contradictions in the methodology of both the philosophers and the Mu'tasimahs. <laughs> Kada su došli u dodir sa dijelima koja su daleko od objave proizvod mišljenja čovjekova od grških dijela da bi kasnije u neke krugove oni koji su poznavajući din pozabavili se da vide šta kažu te knjige.
Šta su to prethodnici, šta su to ljudi prije njih, kad je u pitanju razum? One će mu govorili, pa smo vidjeli da je tako nastao jedan pravac koji se na određen način udalio od Allahove riječi i od riječi njegova poslanika, ali ih se na to se reći. Nekakva slobodna shvatanja, nekakva slobodna poimanja, nekakvi poim zaključci i taj pravac je nazvan kako od uleme, kako je poznat, o čemu su poznati ti? Ilmul kelam, il ahlul kelam. Znači, oni koji su govorništvom se bavili, koji su određene postavke, određene zaključke, nadahnuti razumijevanjem riječi, pokušali da pretvore u pravac i pravilo, a na takav način su zapostavili koja su to pravila i propisi vezani za govor stvoritelja subhanahu wa ta'ala i govor njegova poslanika alihi salatu wa sallam.